The term herpetofauna is used by biologists to describe both reptiles and amphibians. On this episode, we'll meet bog turtles, tree frogs, and hellbender salamanders. We'll also learn about the amazing alligator and participate in Georgia's first annual alligator hunt. Coming up next. Though they have many differences, biologists call both reptiles and amphibians herpetofauna, herptiles, or simply herps. The southeastern United States is rich in herptile biological diversity. But to protect this wealth, we need to better understand and appreciate these creatures. Species like the eastern indigo snake, the gopher tortoise, and the flatwood salamander are now federally and state protected because of threats like loss of habitat, environmental pollution, and invasive species which compete with native species. These threats are big problems because herps are important parts of their ecosystems. The reptiles and amphibians are a huge part of the biodiversity in um, the southeast and really throughout the world. There are many, many species of, of frogs, um, turtles, snakes, and so on and they're an important part for the food chain. They're eaten by wading birds and fish and, and other creatures. Amphibians are um, often considered biological indicators primarily because they breed in aquatic habitats and have an aquatic um, larval stage as well as an adult stage that might be li living in the uplands. So, they're vulnerable to any sorts of changes in that aquatic environment or in the terrestrial environment, so it's, it's good to watch their populations to see if there's a larger problem in that ecosystem. The main reason these two diverse groups are studied together is that both are four-legged ectotherms, meaning that their body temperatures fluctuate with the temperature of the environment. But besides both being cold-blooded, their differences are many. Reptiles have scales. Amphibians have very smooth skin. Reptiles are built to uh, avoid desiccation, drying out. They can move around during the day. Most species can and not have to worry about, the, um, about drying out, whereas salamanders have very thin, porous, uh, smooth skin that requires them to be either in the water, in a very moist situation, or out at night when it's very humid. Um, that's a big difference. Uh, all reptiles lay hard-shelled eggs or give live birth. Um, amphibians, most species, at least most species in, in Georgia, lay eggs, and most of the species that lay eggs lay eggs in the water. Talking about their differences doesn't do justice to the fascinating diversity which exists among herps, so let's get to know a few. Frogs and toads are collectively all frogs. Um, toads tend to have a warty skin and live more in the uplands, but really all toads are frogs. We also have what are called tree frogs, which are adapted for living in trees and shrubs, and they have large sticky toe pads on their, their legs, and they're able to climb very well and often able to, to be camouflaged in, in the foliage. We have what are called true frogs, which are um, frogs people are probably most familiar with, things like bullfrogs and pig frogs and leopard frogs. They're usually more closely tied to the water, more aquatic, very good swimmers, and they don't tend to have the, the sticky toe pads of the tree frogs, but we have quite a bit of diversity in, in the types of frogs here in Georgia. The word amphibian comes from the Greek word amphibios, which means two lines. Amphibians have a larval stage and an adult stage that are usually very different from each other. A good example is the change or metamorphosis from the larval gill-breathing tadpole to the adult lung-breathing frog. There are three basic groups of amphibians. The first group is frogs and toads. The second is made up of worm-like animals found only in the tropics. And the third is made up of newts and salamanders. Georgia has a very, very rich salamander diversity. Uh, we've had a couple of new species described and discovered in Georgia just in the last couple of years, so we have 
a little over 50 species of salamanders in Georgia. Um, and in fact, the Southern Appalachian Mountains, which we're in right now, um, has the highest diversity of salamanders in the world. We're in a very rich hardwood forest. It stays very moist throughout the year. The canopy's dense, so it keeps the sun from hitting the ground uh, too hard. You've got a dense leaf litter. It's just perfect conditions for salamanders. They love very moist habitats. A thick duff layer that's very prevalent in a national forest, but not so maybe on, uh, on, on heavily used lands. Georgia has both terrestrial salamanders, which live on land, and aquatic salamanders. The southeast's largest species of terrestrial salamander is the tiger salamander. They have their, this characteristic yellow pattern of spots, and this species breeds in ponds as well, and spends its adult life in the uplands underground, so it's rarely observed. Um, even though they're quite large, most people in Georgia have never seen one. And the marbled salamander is um, related, but much smaller. Again, um, it lives underground in, in crayfish burrows and mammal burrows, and only comes above the surface to breed in, in ponds in the wintertime. Georgia's aquatic salamanders are the largest in the United States. Among them are the siren, the amphiuma, and the eastern hellbender. Unlike most salamanders, hellbenders grow to two and a half feet in length and spend their entire lives in the heavily oxygenated water normally found in cool mountain streams. Hellbenders thrive in clean, cool streams with rocky bottoms and fast-flowing rapids. They're found in the eastern and central part of, our, of, of the country, and they belong to a family that's only represented by two other species besides the hellbender, and that's the Japanese giant salamander and the Chinese giant salamander, which get to four or five feet long. They're enormous salamanders. So the closest relative of this hellbender is in Asia, and it's a pretty, pretty interesting animal. It's fully aquatic. Most of our salamander species are either terrestrial uh, live on land only, or they live on land for part of their uh, life cycle, but must go to water to breed. These guys live exclusively in the water, never come out. One way to test the health of the hellbender population is to locate them in their element, moving water. But John's and Ken's search begins with a disappointment. Well, we found a found a dead hellbender had a huge gash in its head. It looked like someone had either smashed it or gored it or something, but uh, definitely not a predation event. Um, that's something we're really concerned about. For some reason, people fear these things. There's no reason to fear them. They're completely harmless to people. They don't eat trout. They eat crayfish. Um, and they're a threatened species in the state, so it's uh, illegal to kill them. John does find a juvenile hellbender. Hope that the population is surviving, even if the adults are hard to find. But this is good, getting little ones. That Georgia has many species of reptiles, including snakes and turtles. Georgia has 42 species of snakes. Some are beautiful in color, like this corn snake, which lives on mice and other rodents, or this scarlet king snake. Actually, most snake species do a marvelous job of keeping down rodent populations, and only six species of snakes in Georgia are venomous, like the eastern diamondback rattlesnake, the timber rattlesnake, the cottonmouth, and the coral snake, which is very rare. Our state is also home to many species of turtle, including the endangered gopher tortoise, the loggerhead sea turtle, the soft shell turtle, the alligator snapping turtle, and the rare bog turtle. Because this species is so difficult to find, a special radio telemetry study is underway in North Georgia to better understand bog turtles. Tear you up. John Jensen of the Georgia Department of Natural Resources has joined Ken Fahey, high school science teacher and bog turtle researcher, to see how a particular group of bog turtles is okay, faring. I'm going to adjust the signal, turn the attenuator on. Because bog turtles are secretive, transmitters attached to their shells allow Ken to find them in their boggy home. The antenna is directional, and when you get close, you can weaken the signal with an attenuator and then zero in. Nothing over that way. When you get really close, you just simply have to get down in there and search around, both visually and then sometimes stick your hand down a hole and feel around for the turtle. I've got a turtle. You got him? Yep. Okay. 
There he is. <laughs> Lucky grab. Now who, who wouldn't want to come out here and, and get to do that, right? Not only is Ken involved in tracking adult turtles, he is actively helping the population grow. This is the rarest turtle in Georgia, and hardly anyone has ever seen a hatchling bog turtle this age from Georgia. These guys hatched just last week, and we are doing a captive propagation and hatching project, mainly because these guys are so small that uh, they have a lot of predators, very few of them uh, probably survive, but um, the idea is to take some of these, raise them up so that they can move around and escape predators, and we're going to start some new sites. We, this year I had 13 eggs, and I, so far I've had eight hatch. I think I'll have maybe one or two more hatch. Let's hope the baby turtles will like their bog as much as Ken does. You can see all the, all the gnats flying around. Lots of people don't think it's a neat place, but there are a lot of, there are a lot of plants and animals that are found nowhere else. There are different plants, flowering plants. There are unique plants like carnivorous plants, sundews, pitcher plants, that inhabit these areas that live nowhere else. The areas are usually acidic and poor in nutrients. And the plants that live there have trouble getting nutrients, and so they have specialized ways of doing it. There are, are, are orchids that are found nowhere else, and there are then things like the bog turtle and other, other animals, salamanders, snakes, few birds that are, that are rare except for places like this. It's a good thing there are people like Ken and John doing this type of conservation work. All amphibians and reptiles are important parts of our biological diversity and they play critical roles as predators and prey in ecosystems. The declines of these species are clear signals of problems that could ultimately affect human health. Protecting them ultimately means we are protecting ourselves. Can you identify this sound? Have you ever wondered who's making this sound in your backyard? You can now learn more about these sounds with the new Calls of the Wild, vocalizations of Georgia's frogs. This compact disc was produced by the Georgia Department of Natural Resources and presents the unique calls of all 31 species of Georgia's frogs and toads and over 20 minutes of uninterrupted choruses. With the CD is a 16-page booklet with information on each of the species. Visit this website to order yours today. South of Georgia's fall line, you can find our state's largest reptile, the American alligator, and its history is a storied one. Alligators were once very common throughout the coastal areas of the southeastern United States. But in the early 1970s, the alligator was declared a federally endangered species due to widespread hunting for hides. Only through careful management by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and State Departments of Natural Resources, in the last 35 years, the American alligator has made a tremendous comeback. It's not just about the alligator numbers increasing. We have more people, urbanization spreading and expanding into what was wildlife habitat. And it's very important, we need to find a balance. And we need to respect the animals that we come in contact with because we, in essence, have invaded their space. And we need to learn how to, how to live with them. They're found in a wide range of habitats. You know, we have them throughout the marshes, but also in impounded areas. They're found um, in both man-made ponds and natural ponds. You can find them in drainage ditches and canals that go through some of the residential areas. So they are found in, in both your more natural settings, but also your more developed areas. They tend to be somewhat solitary, the males do. They come together um, and reproduce in the May-June time frame. Um, the males and females come together and breed, and then the males go off into more open water habitats. The females then look for suitable nesting habitat. Suitable nesting habitat would be vegetative areas with some protective cover. Um, generally, the nests are located along tributaries that run up into the, the marshy grass areas. They build a, a mound of vegetation, and in that mound is where they lay their eggs. Alligators may be the fiercest predators around, but when small, they are prey for everybody from herons to raccoons. 
Because of this vulnerability, their mothers will protect them for up to two years. One key way biologists track the population of alligators is through the use of aerial surveys. When we're doing the nest surveys, we tend to fly rather high. Um, we're looking over a broad area and what we tend to look for is a hole in the vegetation. Generally when you see this very nice concentrical circle in the vegetation, that's an indication that you need to look a little bit closer. We let the pilot know that we've identified a location. He comes back around and, and then you're looking for that mound of vegetation. It's very hard to get an actual number of species, but what we're more interested in is a range, population number, what is the range, and do we see that trend increasing or decreasing? Because of sound wildlife management, including this type of population survey and restriction on harvest, Georgia's alligator population increased through the 1990s to healthy levels. 2003 marked the first open alligator hunting season in Georgia. A lottery was drawn to allow interested sportsmen and women to try their hands at harvesting an alligator. 180 permits were issued for the inaugural season and training classes were offered by the Georgia Department of Natural Resources to help the hunters ready themselves for this new challenge. Now, anytime you move around them, they're fast. Our classes are going to consist of showing them about four different methods that they can utilize to harvest alligators in Georgia. Ours is an active type of hunt where the hunter would have to go out and pursue the alligator attach some type of restraining line to that alligator so they can fight the alligator or play the alligator, get it close enough to the bank or to the, to the boat to where they could then dispatch or kill the alligator to harvest it. The Blackwell family was chosen as a party permit. This means that each of the Blackwells, Bob, his son Timothy, and his grandson Corey is allowed to harvest an alligator this season. After their training class, they have decided they'll try for all three on one trip while they have the assistance of Kenny Wayne Toller, an experienced nuisance alligator trapper. They got drawn as a party ticket, you know, three generations, and I was shocked to see that happen, and I was glad to be part of it. Kenny Wayne attempts to attract the gator with his gator call. Mm, 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 mm. Why ain't you bigger, little buddy? Spotting a gator is not the challenge. Finding one at least four feet long, the legal limit is much more difficult. He's got a big eye like he's a big gator. Yeah, he does. Mm, 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 mm. First, we uh, spotted him with the light. Uh, their eyes glow red. Real, 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 real. We were able to uh, cast a travel hook across his back and, and get a hook in him. and. Uh, we had to fight him for two and a half hours, and I fought him the first hour. My son fought him the last hour and a half until we were able to get him to the surface and get a harpoon in him. He's sitting on the bottom. Guess we fucking reach him. It was a lot of patience, you know, used up on that one particular alligator. Everybody spent a lot of time frustrated, just him staying on the bottom holding his breath and coming up and not giving us opportunity to get him with a harpoon or a snare. He's trying to stay up under the boat. Yeah, he's, he'll be between eight and nine. See, right now, he's under bottom. I know he's resting on bottom, but lactic acid is building up in him. He'll get to where you can't hardly move, but he'll have to come up soon for air. The alligator has risen, but is too far away to harpoon. Ain't this fun? Yeah, this is ball way. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Can now you... he's going back down to the bottom. Is he? Yeah. He's not staying up long enough to put another spinner in him. I wish I could hold my breath in the water that long. <laughs> what would you do, Kim Wayne? You couldn't eat. No, you couldn't eat, but you could. You'd starve to death. Come on, back this way, Randy. You could, you could show sure do some spear fishing. <laughs> Just keep your bite on his line. Cause he's coming up now. He's coming up. When he's on the oh. spinner, he's real, he's easy to get off. And once the harpoon is the next step to secure him to the boat. And the harpoon just goes under his skin and turns sideways where he can't get away from us. And uh, we have 
buoys attached to the end of the line and we let the gator go and we come and we get the line and bring him up. That's what it's all about, boys. Gator hunting in Georgia. Hold him, buddy. Hold him, Corey. Keep the light on him at all times. All right. Everybody keep your hands in the boat. A lot of people can catch an alligator on a spinner, but it's no problem as far as getting him on the spinner. When you get him beside the boat, it's good to have somebody with experience as far as handling an alligator to keep somebody from getting hurt. Is your heart beating again there, Kenny Wayne? The alligator has broken the spinner line, but the second harpoon will allow our team to snare the gator and then to dispatch it safely. <laughs> it's over, boys! <laughs> He's bigger than you thought. How about that, buddy? He's a lot bigger than you thought. Ease him down, ease him down, hold. Ease him up. He's rolling what he's doing. Get him, Kenny Wayne. Get him, Kenny Wayne. Yes, sir. That's what we asked. Give me five. Don't pull, don't pull him in the boat. Don't let him get the boat. You want me to fish back? See you right there. Right, right there at the end of my paddle. Right here? Yeah. He's history. Keep going, keep going. That's good. There you go, buddy. I mean, the alligator just seemed to be growing and growing as they were pulling him in. Uh, you could see the uh, head, and, and it looked like it's just huge. And then when you get him in the boat, it, it's just uh, success, just joy, just uh, flowing through you. It's absolutely awesome, awesome experience. Well, I was pretty amazed how big it was. Had fun the whole time, uh, but uh, yeah, the pressure's off now that we got us a, a trophy in the bag. We didn't think he was near this big. We thought we thought he was maybe seven foot long, eight foot long, and he turned out to be uh, almost ten foot long, and that's that's what we were after. <laughs> we plan to uh, make some leather goods, have the hide tan. We're going to eat the meat, have it processed, and uh, hopefully have some uh, belts and wallets made for the family. Get a spoon, get a spoon. got uh, one alligator so far. He's nine foot, eight inches long. And one on the line that uh, my grandson is uh, fighting for a while. Oh, Randy, oh, where you at? The second gator took about 45 minutes once we hooked him with a spinner, being underwater, and we got him up to the boat and got him harpooning him. Pretty reasonable you know, amount of time, about what would be expected of one in this kind of temperature. Felt like he was caught on something and all of a sudden he just rose up. He's coming up. Stops. Right there. Don't shoot him in the bone. Shoot him there. Right here? Yeah. Up, up, up closer. Right there. Go toward his eyes. Uh -huh. Toward his eyes. Right there. Right there. Two gators out of a possible three. Our hunters appear satisfied with a successful hunt. Man, this is it, huh? Uh, my daddy started me hunting uh, when I was just a small boy, and uh, we've just enjoyed the, the times outdoors. Uh, spending time together, uh, getting away and relaxing, having a great time. And like I say, it's memories we'll cherish for a lifetime. I love hunting with my family. 
we'll never forget the times of being together, the memories. Uh, to, to be able to be with your son is just a, a tremendous blessing. I can remember when we first started hunting, and now my grandson is with us. Yes, I will be a hunter forever. The Georgia Reptile Amphibian Rescue Effort is a nonprofit animal welfare group involved in wild animal and exotic animal rescue and rehabilitation. GRARE also reaches out to the community through live animal programs and storytelling. While the majority of their programs are aimed at children, GRARE can teach kids of all ages about reptiles and amphibians, responsible pet ownership, and why wild animals do not make good pets. Visit this website if you know a group of kids who would like a visit from the Georgia Reptile Amphibian Rescue Effort. The photos pictured here could be yours. Enter the fourth annual Georgia Outdoors Nature Photography Contest. You could win an opportunity to be part of a Georgia Outdoors episode and a trip to a photo-worthy destination in Georgia. Rules and restrictions apply.